My name is Nancy Knowlton. I'm a scientist here at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, and I've just published a book with National Geographic entitled Citizens of the Sea. It's written to celebrate the uh, conclusion of a 10-year effort to determine what lives in the ocean, what used to live in the ocean, and what will live in the ocean. It's called the Census of Marine Life. Now, why did you write, personally want to write a book like this? Well, you know, the, the census actually approached me about the idea of it, and uh, of course I could have said no, but it, act, it really appealed to me because I've been collecting stories in my head for a long time about what makes o ocean organisms interesting and, and appealing and funny and awe-inspiring. And so as soon as they talked about the idea of doing something for the census, I thought, oh, this is a wonderful opportunity to kind of pull together all these stories that I've had in my head for 35 years and put them together in a, in a way that tells a story about the ocean and also celebrates the census at the same time. Nancy, you're one of the National Geographic experts and Smithsonian experts on the marine ecosystems, and yet you say in researching this book you learned quite a few things. Can you I, tell us some of the things you might have learned? I did learn uh, quite a few things. Um, I, I mean, I obviously had a sense of the the information that was available on the various topics that I chose to write about. I chose about, to write about uh, locomotion and reproduction and dangerous animals and valuable animals and, and plants for that matter and, and names and numbers, lots of different topics. And so I had a general idea of what was known under those categories. But to make a story compelling, it's, it's, I think it's really good to have details, uh, things you can sink your teeth into that are surprising. So, for example, I knew that uh, seals had whiskers and that the whiskers must be, must be touch sensitive, but I had no idea that they were so sensitive they were almost like the hands of monkeys in terms of the number of whiskers and how well connected they were to the brain. And I knew there were lots of microbes in the ocean, but I didn't know that if you put them all on a scale they would weigh five to ten times more than all the big stuff if you weighed that. So. Almost every story that I wrote, I learned something about the details, which really actually surprised me quite a bit. Tell us a little bit about the style and who you aimed the book at. Well, I wrote the book uh, to, to appeal to a lot of people, uh, people who might not know anything about the ocean or people who know a fair amount about the ocean but never really studied it formally. And, and actually, even a beginning graduate student in ocean sciences would learn quite a lot from reading this book. Even, although it's written without jargon, so there's no science terminology in it, but there are a lot of concepts in there. I sort of think of it as science below the radar. But there's a, actually, there's a wonderful review of the book where the person wrote that it was good for anyone from the ages of 6 to 100, which I, I hope is true. It, it's meant to, you can read it at many levels, just like a good uh, museum exhibit can be viewed at many levels. This book, you can read it from the, as a beginner or as, or as actually as a reasonable expert in the ocean and still learn quite a lot. Now we're trying to promote ocean literacy if you want to call it that. What should we know about the ocean and why we ordinary people? I think it's important to know that the ocean is incredibly important to people around the world. You can live in the middle of a continent. You can live in Iowa or uh, Arkansas and or you can live in California or Florida and obviously the people in Florida and California are closer to the ocean but we're all connected by the ocean. Uh, the ocean provides food to a lot of people. It provides uh, jobs, uh, particularly for tourism. It even provides medicines and of course it's, it's a source of enormous pleasure and relaxation to anyone who takes vacation near the ocean. So that's one thing I think it's important to know. And then the other thing is that to know is that the ocean is in trouble. We've been treating it like a sort of like a garbage can for too long, uh, taking dumping a lot of stuff that we didn't want uh, in it and then pulling out of the ocean uh, way too much relative to what the ocean can sustain. And so the ocean now is in trouble. And uh, it's really, you can see it suffering. Anyone who's been looking at the ocean, as I have for 30 years, has seen enormous changes. The reefs that I used to study uh, when I was a student uh, used to be covered with living coral, and now there's almost no living coral left. And yet, despite the fact that the, the oceans are in trouble, it's also the case that we, we still have time to do something. So if we really start thinking about using the ocean sustainably, then there is time to turn around. But the time to act is now. We can't keep postponing uh, taking care of the ocean. In fact, I was interested to note that your book does have a section and a couple of chapters on being back in business and the ocean recovering. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, there are a number of or or organisms that have actually started to come back or are really fully back. In fact, uh, if you put, uh, whales uh, are a good example, turtles, uh, some of the fish like striped bass. Uh, if you actually set up, if you actually concentrate on 
sustainably managing fisheries or protecting, uh, say, marine mammals, they actually often do bounce back. And so these are organisms that have uh, come back enormously. Sea otters, for example, were hunted almost to extinction. Now they more than pay their way as tourist attractions on the, in the central California coast. One of the things that I found really fascinating is that you say there are more microbes in the ocean than stars in the universe. How important are microbes to the ocean and what do they do for us? Well, the, every other that's one of the mantras of ocean sciences is every other breath you take, uh, the oxygen was created by an ocean microbe. So, but it's not just the oxygen. They create the entire chemistry of the planet. Uh, I think it's safe to say that microbes rule the world. And uh, another thing about the book is it's just full of weird and wonderful and absolutely fabulous creatures that you just cannot imagine. I mean, stuff out of movies, Aliens of the Deep. Do you think there's still big discoveries to be made about life in the sea? Oh, there are huge discoveries to be made because the ocean is uh, 70, over 70% 70 of the surface and over actually over 95% of the habitable real estate of the planet. So we have hardly explored most of the ocean. There's a, the deepest o part of the ocean, the Marianas Trench, has only been visited once by human beings, two people who went down to the bottom of the trench about 50 years ago. Now, there are a lot more people who have been on the surface of the moon than have been to the Marianas Trench. And because there's so much... Uh, area just to explore. Most of the ocean hasn't been studied. And even in shallow water, where people go quite a lot, most of the, in, in coral reefs, for example, where something like a quarter to a third of all the things that live in the ocean live, live with reefs, most of those animals, the small ones in particular, don't have never been studied or don't even have names. The book coincides with the ending of the 10-year census of marine life, as you pointed out. Thousands of scientists looking at what's in the sea, it strikes me that maybe after all that we end up with knowledge that in fact there's a lot more about the ocean we don't know than we did 10 years ago. Is that, is that a fair assumption? Yeah, I think the, the results of the census showed that uh, there's, there's actually, the ocean's hugely diverse, much more diverse than we realized. For example, I was part of a project that studied coral reefs, and we found that, and just looking at small standardized samples to get a sense of, you know, do the same thing in a number of different places so you could compare, we found that there are actually more, diff more different kinds of crabs in about six square meters or six square yards of coral reef than there are in all of Europe. Uh, and so we know that there are lots of crabs and lots of other things that live re on reefs, but we actually still can't put a number. The estimates range from 1 million to over 10 million. And so even, even to a factor of 10, we don't know how many things live in the, in a, live on, uh, in the ocean at large. And, and so we now know, we have a bit, much better sense of the scale of the unknown. We, we, know how, we, we, have, we, bit, we know much better what we don't know, but there, we still have a lot to do. Nancy, thank you so much for taking time out of your work here at the Smithsonian to talk about your book. Thank you very much.